I would invite you then to turn in your Bible this evening to Genesis 22. I was reading Genesis 22 recently, and there we have a record of what the <laughs> Jewish people call the Akita, that is the binding, the binding of Isaac. And thinking about it, I was captivated by the account when I thought about the fact of what Abraham says in Genesis 22, verse 5. Let's just read from verse 1 on to that. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told them. Then, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, I want you to hear this. Abide ye here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. The thing that really gripped me was what Abraham calls this act that he was involved in. If you note in that fifth verse, he calls it worship. I came to realize that this is the first time that the word worship appears in the Bible. There are There is a uh, somewhat informal interpretation uh, exercise in which you take the first mention of a, of a word in the Bible, <laughs> take the final mention of that word, and then one in between to try to develop the thought. Well, okay. the next, I could say, further mention of worship is in Jesus' words in John chapter 4. You remember it? He says, the Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. And the final mention is in John's uh, revelation, the last chapter, where, remember, John falls down in, at the feet of an angel, and the angel says, get up, I'm just uh, uh, like you are. And he says, worship God. This is an instance of worship, and I want to talk to you about the substance of worship from this passage, the essence of that worship, and then the importance of that to you and I. Let's pause a moment. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is an amazing passage in so many ways, but it really is amazing when we think about it that this is an act of worship that Abraham realized he was engaged in. It's startling. And I pray that you would just use this to teach our hearts, to soften our hearts, to bring our hearts into line with your heart. Make us true worshipers, as Jesus said, as we think about these things for the next few minutes. We pray in Jesus' name. That is for his glory. Amen. Amen. So what is the basis for what is Abraham's incredible worship that is pictured here? Well, I think that we have to go back a few chapters, perhaps to chapter 18, where there is a meeting. In chapter 18, there is a wonderful meeting between Abraham and God. 
God appears to Abraham in a human body. Remember those three angelic visitors yes. in that 18th chapter. Whenever there is a meeting with God, it is always God initiated. He's the one that sets it up. He's the one that takes the first steps toward any human being. <laughs> and this act of worship that we have recorded here in this chapter is based on that relationship that was developed as a result of Abraham having a meeting with God. It's not, one, it's not the only one that he had. But it is significant. Because in that meeting, God gave Abraham some very vital information. Gave information to both Abraham and Sarah about them and about their future. And I just might uh, have you listen as uh, I just read a little bit of what God said to them in chapter 18 and the 10th verse. The Lord says to him, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And then dropping down uh, to the uh, 13th verse, the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child which am old? Verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return to thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. This is part of the substance that leads up to this act of worship in chapter 22. It begins with a meeting with God. And Abraham's amazing faith that enables him to worship the Lord as he does is the result of a personal encounter with God. Have you had one? And have you had a personal encounter with the Lord recently? It is that encounter, that meeting, that gives to Abraham such a, a message that brings incredible confidence to him. In fact, looking back on that, Act in Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to these verses. This is what the writer of Hebrews says about it all. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises, Genesis 18, he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Listen to his amazing faith, verse 19. Abraham accounted that God was able to raise him, Isaac, up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Absolute trust, total confidence in the word of God. This is what takes place when you have a meeting with the Lord. And God gives you a message in that meeting. And that's the reason why he meets with you, because he has something to say to you. There's a meeting with a message. And when the word of God comes to you, when God's promise, like to Abraham, is placed in your heart, you totally believe it. This is real evidence that you have had an encounter with the Lord, because his word is placed in your heart. His promises, you have total confidence that you know it was the Lord. So that's the substance that really is behind this act of worship in Genesis 22. Now let's look at it and see the essence of this worship. What does Abraham's worship entail anyway? This akedah, this binding of Isaac. I would say that it is worship at its peak. It's worship at its climax. Look at the act of Abraham here and Isaac. What Abraham and Isaac did on that mountain seems very odd. It seems like a very odd kind of worship to us. Kind of the, the, the 
perhaps the oddest imaginable. They didn't go up on that mountain and sing praise choruses. They didn't go up there and have a jam session. What happened was that Isaac completely submitted to be tied up. And he wasn't a little kid either. The reality is that Isaac was around 40 years of age when this took place. He could have resisted. But Isaac completely submitted to be tied up and to be placed on that altar. To willingly lay down his life in obedience to the, what he thought and knew was the will of God. And Abraham, it must have pulled his heart out. Abraham selflessly laid this promised only son on the altar to actually slit his throat and offer him as a burnt sacrifice to God. He was willing to do that. In his mind, he had done that because he believed that if he did, God would raise this promised son up again. That's the essence of this act. But I want to Think about the attitude behind that for a moment. This worshipful attitude. You know what it is? An attitude of worship? Very clearly, it's a selfless sacrifice of yourself, your body, your soul, your spirit, your all. It's willingly giving yourself and your dearest possessions to God. To give yourself and everything that is attached to you. That's the attitude of worship expressed here in this. Now, in closing, let's just think about the importance of it. There's a lot of confusion about what worship is. But the Bible clears it up. I think the Bible straightens it out and uh, irons out the wrinkles. One thing, I don't know if you recognized it or you caught it in the song that we just sung. <clears throat> it says, uh, you're worthy of worship and praise. They're two different things. Praise is different from worship. Every time you see praise in the scripture, praise would drive you to lift up your hands or yourself toward, the, uh, toward God in heaven. But worship in the scripture, worship puts you on your face before God. Every time you see worship in the Bible, almost without exception, it's associated with people either bowing down before the Lord or falling to the ground before God in great reverence and in tremendous awe of him. You know what worship is? And here's the importance of it. Worship is a presentation. It, an act of worship in which you personally present yourself and all that pertains to you, you lay it on the altar. You hold nothing back. You retain nothing for yourself. You give yourself as a living sacrifice holy unto God. Two of the most precious possessions Abraham laid on that altar. His only son and his future, because his future was wrapped up in that boy. And Abraham held nothing back from God. And I want to challenge each one of us tonight to answer this question in your heart. Has my worship ever reached that level? Have you ever worshipped like that? You know how to worship? Here's a great example of it. And I don't believe that any of us have ever really been spirit-filled till we have reached the place where Jesus is absolutely number one in our life. Because that's what the Spirit does. 
Isaac represents Abraham's future. And Abraham is living in the light of God's promise to him. And now God asks him to give up that promise. But you know, you're never free until you become totally detached. Until you're living only for God. Not for your ambition. Not for another's ambition for you. Not for your future. I don't think that God wants his followers to be grabby. To grab whatever they can get. He's looking for people who hold everything. Their job, their money, their status, their family. People who hold everything on their open palm of their hand and not in a clenched fist. I was reading just uh, the other day in Job, starting that book over again, and I'm always amazed. The end of that first chapter, after he suffers blow after blow, I mean, boom, 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 all within the space of a short time, an hour. And yet, what does he say? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all that, Job sinned not. He didn't blame God. I read a, a story. I don't know if you're familiar with the devotional book, Streams in the Desert. Um, it was written or compiled, rather, by a woman, Letty uh, Kalman. Anyway, when she and her husband were newly married, her husband, God was dealing with him, working in him mightily. They were in a missionary meeting, and the preacher was A.B. Simpson. A.B. Simpson was the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance. But anyway, A.B. Simpson was, was giving, uh, taking an offering. And uh, he said, the first offering I want to take tonight <clears throat> is a, a gold offering. And he said, we're going to be passing the offering plates, and you're going to find that there are a lot of wristwatches in the offering plate. And if you, uh, if you have a gold wristwatch, uh, you take one of those watches out of the offering plate, and you put your gold uh, watch in that offering plate and will then take those watches and cash them in and use it for missions. So the plate comes to the Kalmans and Mr. Kalman takes his watch off and puts it in the plate and she leans over to him. She said, I gave that to you. Then once that offering was taken, another offering uh, was mentioned. This time, he said, I want you to look and see if you have any jewelry on you that you don't need, that is more than you need, and put that in the offering plate, and we'll cash that in and give it to missions. The offering plate came by the Kalmans, and he took off his wedding ring. Actually, he took off her engagement ring. That's what he did. He reached over to her hand. He took off the engagement ring and put it in the offering plate. And she said, you gave that to me. And then there was a third offering that was taken. He said, uh, this offering is different. Uh, when we take this offering, what I'd like you to do, if you believe that God wants to use you and you're willing to just offer yourself to the Lord for however he wants to use you in his work, I want you to come forward. And she felt her husband getting up and she tried to hold him back. And, and finally the Spirit of God had got a hold of her heart and they went up together and they surrendered their lives to the Lord. They served him faithfully. Worship. It's 
an unattachment to anything except to God himself. Abraham, he said to the young men, you stay here with the donkeys. The lad and I will go yonder and we'll worship. Oh, that we would worship like that. That we would know that kind of worship, that kind of utter detachment from everything else. That we would say, Lord, I'm yours and everything that I have is yours and you're welcome to it. Until that's settled, I wonder if we've ever really worshipped. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the example that we have of worship in the life of Abraham. Can't imagine that. And yet, Lord, he was willing. He had a worshipful heart. Oh, God, would you give us that kind of a heart? Would you make us a worshipful people like that? Because as we've sung, if we really meant what we've sung, you're worthy of worship. You're worthy of that kind of worship. Oh, Lord, humble our hearts. If you have to, strip away from us whatever it is that we're holding on to, that we're retaining for ourselves and holding back from you. Strip it away from us. Lord, we want to hold everything on an open palm so that you don't have to crush our clenched fist in order to receive what we what we should be freely offering. So, Lord, here we are. We offer ourselves in worship to you tonight and just thank you and praise you for a privilege of offering ourselves to the our righteous Father, the Good Shepherd, a wonderful Lord. You pray, Lord, tonight that as we think on these things and share testimony of your moving and working in our lives, that we would continue to encourage one another to love at good works. In Jesus' name, amen.